Mother's Day is a day filled with many emotions. For some, Mother's Day is mostly about joy. It's about maybe breakfast in bed, crafts created by little fingers, homemade Mother's Day cards made out of construction paper and crayons. Or at least made with crayons. I don't know if it's made of crayons. For others, today is a day of mixed emotions. There's, there's a joy of much of what's going on now, maybe joy of children. But there's also the pain of a mother who's no longer here, who's went to be with the Lord. For others, Mother's Day is one of the hardest days of the year. Either because of past abuse, because of the death of a child, the guilt that hangs over a past abortion. For many reasons, for, for some, Mother's Day is a tough day. One in six couples in the United States struggle with Issues of infertility and, and the whole issue of not being able to have children when you want to have children. Well, what, wherever you're coming from this morning, we're glad you're here. And we believe God's word has something to say to us. Amen? Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you turn to John, the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, we'll be looking at verses 16 through 21. It's also on the YouVersion Bible app, if you have that. There's an outline also in the bulletin. Let's read. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately... The boat was at the land to which they were going. If we were to look back earlier in the sixth chapter of John, we would find the feeding of the 5,000. If we looked before that, we would find that they were tired. There was, a, there was this crowd that gathered. They wanted to send them home. The disciples said, send the crowd home. We don't have enough food for them. And Jesus said, you feed them. And then the miracle happened, and the 5,000 were fed, 5,000 plus men and women. And then they tried to make Jesus forcefully king. Look at John 6, 15. It says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Then we, we pick up the story where we did today. So Jesus is off in the mountain, at the mountain, excuse me, and the disciples are in the boat. Matthew, in his gospel, we'll look there, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, he tells the story this way. He says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So why did they go? Because Jesus made them go. Jesus said, go. Immediately he made the disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, 
beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. There's a lot of people in our culture who try to give us comfort they try to flatter us, but the comfort they give and the encouragement they give is not based on any kind of fact. I don't know if you've had that experience where you didn't get much encouragement from someone because they really didn't know what they were talking about. You see, there's a difference between skating on thin ice and walking on water as Jesus did. The difference? Jesus the truth of who he is, the reality of Christ. If you have your outline, I'd, I'd like to just call our attention to six points. First, Jesus sends us into storms. The disciples were sent by Jesus into the storm. Why is that important? One, it means... That storms don't mean that God doesn't exist. It just means that God doesn't always work the way we expect him to. True? Two, storms don't mean that God doesn't love you or care for you. God never does evil or never tempts anyone to do evil. But he does ordain our life in such a way that there will be storms. Storms don't mean that God is punishing you. True, God at times punishes, but just because you're going through a storm doesn't mean you're being punished by God. A mentor and friend of mine, Steve Anderson, has been de dealing with bladder cancer. Things didn't look good. Well, I have great praise for you today. They've gotten all the cancer and he's doing well. I say that because I want to say this. Steve didn't get cancer because God was punishing him. Steve didn't get cancer because he didn't have as much faith as someone else. Why did Steve get cancer? Years of theological training, years of being a pastor have taught me to say this. I don't know. Right? Nothing in our text today says exactly why Jesus sent them through the storm, does it? Point two. Sometimes we don't feel the presence of Christ while we're in the storm. In their case, Jesus wasn't in the boat. He was on the mountain and then walked on the water to them, right? In our case, sometimes it, it, we don't feel the warm and fuzzy presence of Christ all the time in our struggles. It's true? Does that mean he doesn't exist? No. Point three, we should keep rowing in our times of not knowing. Now, Someone who dearly loves the Bible, I want to point out that this truth can't just be taken from the story, because you can't just take a story and say, because they did that, that's what we should do. 
and interpreting the Bible, we say that narrative's not imperative. In other words, you can read a story of what the disciples did, that doesn't mean that's what you're supposed to, supposed to do, right? But I think that if we look at Scripture, we can see over and over again that trusting God is not inactive. It means doing what he's called you to do. Amen? And I think it was right that they continued to row. Right? What does that mean for us? Many of you have been praying for us in our transition that our house in Iowa would sell. It hasn't sold. We keep rowing not knowing why or when it will sell. We don't just say, okay, well, the bridge loan's up, so I guess we'll just sit here and keep praying. It means we go get the financing necessary, right? You don't know. You've been praying about a circumstance and it doesn't seem to be changing, do what you believe God's calling you to do and keep doing it, right? Keep rowing even when you're not knowing. It's so important, is it not? You see, some people really miss that. Four. Our false perceptions can, can, create, can create unnecessary fear. Do you believe that? How many people can relate to laying in bed at night imagining, imagining all kinds of problems? Do you have a problem about this big that becomes about this big by worry? Do your concerns roll in, sometimes not in the direction of prayer as they should, but to more and more worry, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Right? How many things in our life have we spent time worrying about that never happened? How much of our energy is spent? How much of Our emotion is spent on things that never took place. Matthew Henry, who wrote hundreds of years ago, put it this way. Our real distresses are often much increased by our imaginary ones. Disciples are out there in their boat and they think Jesus at first is a ghost and it increases their fear. If you're going through a storm, I would encourage you, I would encourage you to examine your perception. Make sure it's an accurate one, a God-centered one. Point five, our fears can cause us to falter. Peter looked away from Jesus to the waves and he sank. Choose the word there, falter, not fail, because failure is not failure until it's the last time you try, and he who began a good work in us will bring it to its day of completion if we know Jesus. Amen? But we need to walk in faith, not in fear. Point six, Jesus can get us through the storm to where we're called to be. Jesus can get us through the storm to where we're called to be. I would say, even when our own stupidity and sinfulness helped create the storms of our life, that's not what happened in this case, but sometimes we we create some of our own problems. Even there, God knows how to get us where we need to get. Right? I've been doing biblical counseling for years. I've never had to say to somebody, 
look, here's the situation. God had a, had a plan for your life, but in college you screwed up so much, he, he has no idea what to do with you now. He had no idea you'd be here today. I mean, I've got no idea what to tell you because, you know, that's not the God we serve, is it? God never looks down and says, I don't know what to do. He, he is never surprised. Isn't that good news? Jesus can get us through the storm to where we're called to be. Not only, not only in location, but in attitude. Right? George Mueller, some of you know that name. George Mueller, who through prayer cared for thousands of orphans. I encourage you to search his name on the internet and study his life if you haven't. He spoke a prayer, and he said he would pray. He would pray this prayer: "Lord, do not let this trial pass until you've taught me what you'd like to teach me by it." Wow. God does powerful things in us and through us in times of storms. Does he not? But always remember the storm is never our final destination. Amen? He knows not only how to get us where, where we need to be for the next step, he knows how to get us to heaven. And that's only through Jesus Christ, through our faith and trust in him. A lot of mornings when I come in, the sermon notes ready, and I, and I begin to pray, is there something else, Lord, that, that you would want me to say this morning, something that maybe I should include in the sermon? Sometimes I'll just look at all the books on the shelf, and is there a story here? Is there something here? This morning I grabbed a chicken soup for the soul, teenager version. It could be hit or miss there, right? And I found a story of Glenn Cunningham. Anyone know who that is? Another exercise in your internet search. Please don't do that right at this moment. At the age of seven, Glenn and his older brother Floyd were badly burned in a schoolhouse fire. Floyd died, and Glenn was not expected to be able to walk. The doctors advised his parents, according to several sources, to amputate his leg. They chose instead to pray and continue to seek medical advice. In the end, they were able to see Glenn keep his legs. He learned to walk and then to run. In high school, he ran races to run the races, it meant extensive massaging of the legs and warm-up before a race, caring for his legs after the race also. But let's talk a little bit about his running career. He ran for the United States in the 1932 Olympic Games, placing fourth in the 1500 and won the silver medal in 1936 at the Olympics in Berlin. He was the fastest miler in the Amateur Athletic Union in 1933, 1935, 1936, 1937, and 1938. 
In fact, in 1934, he set a world record that was not broken for three years, running the mile in four minutes and six seconds. He received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Kansas in 1933. The University of Iowa he got his MA from in 1936. And New York University awarded him the PhD. He taught physical education at Cornell College from 1940 to 1944 and served in the Navy for two years. In 1947, he established the Glen Cunningham Youth Ranch, at which he helped thousands of troubled youths over a period of more than 30 years. Glenn believed in God. He loved the Bible. He loved God. He loved Jesus. And it gave him strength and faith to weather the storm. Imagine what Glenn's life would have looked like if he just sat around trying to figure out why God allowed for him to be burned. Would have missed it, wouldn't he? Have you heard this prayer? The author is unknown. It goes like this. I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I ask for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I was asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. God truly does bless us in the storms. Now I'm going to ask the praise team to come. We're going to talk about 10,000 reasons we have to praise the Lord. But it is Mother's Day. And I want to end our time today by sharing three lessons that I received from my mother. Is that all right? Perseverance. You stay with it. You stay the course. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't complain, just keep moving forward, right? You guys may not know it, but I didn't learn to read until I was in the third grade. She said, keep at it. One of the bittersweet moments of my life was receiving my doctorate degree because by that time my mother had passed away and was in heaven. And I wanted to see her out there as I walked across the stage. But she'd been there to see me get my master's and my bachelor's. Second, mom taught me about prayer. She said, if you wake up in the middle of the night worried, get out of bed and pray. Pray, pray, pray. Amen? And last thing, there's many things she taught me. The last thing she taught me is stay positive. And I, and I, I haven't done that as well as I'd like to have. Sometimes I think I'm addicted to my own grumbling. And when I would do that as a kid... My mom would make me go watch Pollyanna, the movie, <laughs> and play the glad game again. So if you've ever watched it, another thing you can look up on your internet search. Those are, those are biblical things, right? We're told to pray without ceasing. We're told to keep on in Scripture, to run the, with, with endurance the race that's set, that, that set up for us, Right? And we're certainly told in Philippians 4.8 to think about positive things.